introduction and for inviting me. It's very nice to be here. Uh, it's so beautiful. It's just been warmer than Toronto. That's all I have to say. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, <clears throat> so I want to kind of uh, give a slightly different view of a Teichmuller theory than than I usually do from the point of view of geodesic currents, right? So usually Teichmuller theory is conformal structures and extremal lengths and so on and so on. So this would be slightly different. So from the point of view of the hyperbolic geometry and laminations and currents and so on, right? So, um, so let's start. Uh, as usual, uh, you have a surface. So sigma is a, a closed surface. Um, okay. And the, the, maybe I'll start with the definition of current. So C of sigma is the space of a, a geodesic and since I have more time, I can just go over this a bit slowly, and hopefully everybody hasn't, you know, I don't think everybody has seen this. So what is that? So the, let me write the definition. So this is a space of uh, pi 1 sigma uh, invariant uh, rod on measures um, on G of sigma tilde, that's the universal cover of sigma. So that's, so the G, this is the universal cover of sigma. This is the space of geodesics in the universal cover of sigma. And this is, uh, so a current is a pi one invariant measure on the space of geodesics. Uh, so it's kind of weird to call this a geodesic because we don't have any metric on anything. <laughs> so this is a group uh, in some sense. Right, so this, uh, so by the universal cover, so let me, let me do this. So what you usually do is, you think of the universal cover of sigma, um, maybe you pick a particular metric on sigma, and then you can identify this uh, with H2. Right? And the boundary of this uh, is basically the Gromov boundary of the, the fundamental group, so from group theoretic point of view. So having picked a hyperbolic metric here, it's kind of identification of the circuit infinity of H2 with a Gromov boundary of the fundamental group, right? So then the geodesic in this space is basically a pair of points on this boundary, right? So when I say a space of geodesics, all I mean is uh, the endpoints of this path should not be the same, so two different points, right? So, right, so keeping that in mind, the space of geodesics in sigma hat is basically uh, S1 cross S1 minus the diagonal uh, divided by uh, Z2 because I, I don't care about the order, right? And so pi1 acts in here, so pi1 acts on S1. In fact, pi1 acts on this guy. So uh, if I look at topologically, this is a, uh, well, that's the, Torus minus a curve, that's a cylinder, you divide it by Z2, that's a Mobius band, right? So this is a, topologically, that's just a, a Mobius band, but the pi one acts in a very crazy way, so in fact, acts, uh, orbits of points are dense and so on, right? Okay, so anyway, so this is the space of geodesics, and you have a pi one action, and if you have a measure which is invariant under that, uh, so I call that the geodesic current. The rod and measure just means that locally has to be finite, but the global measure could be infinite. Right? And the, the topology is a weak star topology. We don't have to get into all that. So let me just give some examples. So this kind of sounds abstract. Um, so one, one good example is the Liouville measure. So if I pick uh, X in the Teichmuller space of sigma, Right. So then the universal cover of X is H2. So this is a specific identification of the boundary of pi 1 of sigma with the boundary of H2, as I just mentioned. Uh, so then here I can define the Liouville measure, right? So So Liouville measure is a measure on the space of geodesics defined as follows. So let's see, what is the open set on the space of geodesics? 
since it's a product of S1 cross S1, an open set is a product of an interval times an interval. Let's say these points are A, B, uh, C, and D. Uh, note that the identification of uh, the boundary of pi 1 of sigma to boundary of H2 is defined only up to action of a Mobius transformation. So we have to find a way to assign a number to this pair that is uh, invariant under the Mobius transformation um, and is additive. <laughs> right? If you pick two open disjoint guys, they would just add up. So there is only a unique solution to that. It's the cross ratio. So there's nothing else you can do. So I, so I think of X now as a measure and it's the measure that gives the assigns to A, B cross C, D uh, log of the cross ratio. Uh, cross ratio is A minus C times B minus D. Uh, these are absolute values. They're Euclidean distances divided by A minus D times B minus C. And just let's take one absolute value again, just to be sure. <laughs> this is positive. So th this is the Liouville measure associated to X. Right. So it's very clearly pi 1 invariant. It determines x uniquely and, and vice versa. So, so that's very nice. So, so keeping this in mind, a point in type space, you can think of it as a conformal structure on sigma. You can think of it as a hyperbolic structure on sigma. But you can also think of it as a measure on a space of geodesics, namely the Liouville measure. Right. So that's the point of view I want to discuss today. So this tells you that the type space is a subspace of a space of currents. Right. And maybe I should have written that over here. I'm sorry? The map is injective, yeah. The map injective, uh, uh, continuous and everything, yeah. That's right. Okay, so that's, that's one good example. Let's have another example. So, uh, so look at the ML. Uh, measured the laminations. So the, we know what these guys are. Mohan talked about them for a long time. Didn't draw a single picture of a lamination <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> so I'll try. <laughs> this is a, yes, a, cl a closed subset of the surface, which is a union of simple and disjoint geodesics with a transverse measure. So, you know, things kind of like that, you know. So this lamination looks like that. That's uh, that's lambda. Um, so there's a notion of a you know transverse measure. If I pick an arc omega, I know how many geodesics go through. So this is exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about here, right? So if I look at my intervals i and j again, I I have a notion of how many geodesics start with i and end in j. Uh, if you want to write this precisely, you have to look at the measure of this arc plus this arc minus this arc minus this arc, but let me not get into that. So if you know locally how many geodesics are passing through, you can assign to any set of geodesics some measure, and this is that measure, right? So a transverse measure gives you a measure on the space of geodesics, and then you also cover, again, it's pi 1 invariant because that's the lift of this geodesic lamination. So like, you know, it goes like that. But the, it counts how many jerseys start from here and here. Of course, this number is uncountable. It's a large number. But what is the measure of the set of jerseys which start in I and end in J? So in this situation, I can think of ML also as a subset of geodesic currents. So that's very nice. Uh, let's pick the third example. So a closed curve on sigma. So these are the curves that are no longer simple. They can, uh, they can go whenever you want. You know, maybe something like that. So let's call it gamma. Uh, so again, what I can do is this is a, the current I get here is a counting, a counting current. So that I look at the universal cover. Again, I have a bunch of lifts of gamma like that, and I count how many of them start with I and end in J, okay? So, so gamma as an element in here, so gamma of I cross J is equal to number of lifts 
of gamma uh, with one endpoint in I and one in in J. Okay, so all these geometric objects that you can are are used to seeing, there are um, currents, and in fact, if I did here word uh, weighted, if I added the word weighted here, that still would be okay. I would just count these guys by weight. I would look at the sum of the weights of the lifts and so on. Okay, so let's have some theorems about this. So maybe. Uh, so this is theorem uh, due to Bonahan. So first of all, the the set of weighted uh, closed curves are dense in the space of currents. Um, there is uh, nothing else in some sense. So you might think this makes sense for the, so for two because laminations are basically the closure of a space of curves to begin with, right? After, after waiting, so that's fine. But uh, you should think how does it make sense for one? The, how is the Riemann surface uh, limit of a closed curve? And but still that kind of makes sense. If you pick a generic direction and move around for a long time until you come close and you close up, the curve you get is basically goes everywhere in all directions equally often. So if you look at it, the way it meshes to itself, it resembles X. And in fact, that sequence converges to X uh, after you weight it correctly and so on. So that's the fact that this is dense is, yeah, I guess so, sure. Uh, Okay, sure. Uh, who who would you think that's due to? The, everything else I'm going to say is due to Bonhan. This, I just this, <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, like this sentence, I just need to say the next sentence. But but yeah, yeah. This is probably classical. Uh, even Bonahan's work is <laughs> classical. So so, <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, it's the eight eighties now. It's like <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> 80s, <laughs> like half of these people were not born in the 80s. Okay, so so let's let's go on. So the uh, so the what I what I want to say is that so there is a pairing between weighted closed curves, namely the intersection number, right? So um, so when I say so geometric. Intersection number. Uh, this is a pairing between closed curves. If I have two different uh, closed curves, let's say this one and the one which maybe twists here uh, twice and goes around, you can count how many times is the minimum number of times these guys intersect. And if they have the weight, you can just multiply the weights and add them up and so on. So, uh, so closed curves and weighted closed curves have a pairing, a natural pairing, namely the intersection number, and this extends uh, uh, continuously uh, to, uh, let's say, homogeneous um, bilinear Pairing, which again I call it I because it's really intersection number uh, between from C cross C to R plus. And here is what one is important. So these guys are dense and there's a pairing between them and they can extend this pairing to a pairing between everybody, right? So the, the thing is basically if they can limit in different ways and you know the, the pairings also con converge. So that's what you have to show here. So th there's a way of taking intersection number of of two points, so it is always positive, and so plus, just let's say r bigger than or equal to zero, I don't know what r plus means, it could be zero, and in fact, um, if, uh, so for alpha in a space of currents, intersection of alpha with itself is equal to zero has a specific meaning, 
uh, these are only simple closed curves and their closure, which is the lamination. So this is true if and only if lambda is in ML. So the only currents which have zero self-intersection number are, are the current, the, these guys. So, so that's very good. And this pairing actually has a particular meaning. If I can, maybe I'll go up here. So in a particular case that we're interested in, if a gap is a closed curve uh, or a lamination, and x is a point in the tacular space, then this particular pairing, so look, this gamma and x are both currents now, and we have a pairing between any pair of currents, so I can pair x and gamma, and this actually is equal to the hyperbolic length of uh, gamma in x. Yes. Uh, alpha. Usually I do laminations with lambda, so that's why I wrote lambda there. But yeah, a, a current intersects itself zero times if it's actually a lamination. And uh, so the remaining object, the hyperbolic length, is also this. Uh, so the geometric intersection number is the same kind of object as hyperbolic length. The result of a pairing of associated currents, right? So, so this, is, this is quite beautiful. Um, so let me so understand one more thing that everybody is used to here, which is that the a space of projectivized lamination is the boundary of Heichmuller space. So what is the correct way to see that? So it means that if a sequence of points in Heichmuller space goes to infinity, in some sense, it converges to a lamination. So I want to say that in this language, so what does it mean for a so fix uh, x0, which is your uh, origin of the Teichmuller space. So you, you think of a, uh, xn be a sequence of point Teichmuller space. So going to infinity just means it gets more complicated with respect to this x0. So such that the intersection of x0 and xn is going to infinity. And I want to come up with a lamination that this guy converges to. Right? So that's the notion of going to infinity. So these guys are currents. So I pick, uh, so I try to find the limit of the following lamination. So pick nu be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of xn divided by intersection of x0 and xn. This is n. Uh, this limit exists, so the, the, you don't ask. You know, I mean, you, you would say the sequence converges if this limit exists. So just imagine you take a limit like that of some object. What is this object? First of all, I have to make sure I didn't divide by big numbers. So I want to show this is not zero, <laughs> right? So let's some, check some facts about this new. So for example, what is intersection of new with x zero? Well, is the limit of intersection of, this is just a number, it comes out. So it's x0 with xn divided by intersection of x0 with xn. So that's one. Okay, so, so whatever this object is, it, it has a positive intersection number with x0. So it's not nothing, right? But what is its self-intersection? Well, its self-intersection is, the limit as n goes to infinity of, so I have to put two of these guys together, intersection of xn, xn, divided by intersection of xn, x0, or x0, xn, squared. But it turns out that this number is constant. Maybe I should have written this somewhere. That's my item five. For every point x in Teichmuller space, intersection of x with itself is some fixed number, which is pi squared times Euler characteristic of sigma. Absolute value. So this makes sense also, um, if you think about it, because as I said, if you look at the x, x can be approximated by a long curve which goes all over the place. 
So what is the length of that, that long curve? So if I normalize it, it's basically, right? So if I pick a length, of, so it's basically the volume of the X itself. A curve which goes everywhere in all directions, this length is volume of the tangent, unit tangent model. So this is this, is this number. So, so this is the constant, and this goes to infinity, so this is zero, <laughs> right? So this limit is non-trivial, and it has zero self-intersection number, so it's a lamination, right? Um, in, in fact, it matches the other definition of the boundary that you have. I don't know if people have seen this or not. So you usually would say Xn converges to a lamination if the lengths grow essentially uh, like intersection number, right? So, and that's still true here. Like, for example, if I, so the usual definition is that if I pick two curves, gamma and gamma prime, then the hyperbolic, the limit of hyperbolic length of gamma in X and divided by hyperbolic length of gamma prime in Xn as n goes to infinity. Uh, so let's actually compute this limit given our definition. So what is that? That's the intersection with that, right? So I can write this as limit of intersection of Xn with gamma and intersection of Xn with gamma prime. And then I can divide both sides by intersection of Xn with X0. And then Xn divided by that converges to nu, and this also converges to nu. So this converges to intersection of nu with gamma, intersection of nu with gamma prime. Right, which is the usual definition of the Thurston boundary. So the ratio of lengths is basically ratio of intersections. Right? So that's the usual definition. If you haven't seen the usual definition, don't worry about this part. Uh, just look at that. But uh, let me draw a picture of all this, which will be illuminating. Um, right? I hope. So. The space of currents is an uh, infinite dimensional large space, very, not very pretty, but inside of it, it has a ML, right? It's like I have a pairing here, this bilinear pairing intersection. It's always positive, but sometimes it's zero. So this is almost like a light cone. In, like you should think of R3 with the metric of the degree 1, 1, negative 1, and so you have a light cone here. And the way you see hyperbolic metric in the, in the Minkowski model is that you look at the sphere of a fixed radius inside of that. And that's the Teichmuller space. So Teichmuller space sits here. So all the points which have norm uh, this fixed number, pi squared times the Euler characteristic, right? And then when uh, if so, I have this point x zero, and I have a point x n, and the way I do it is I I look at these lines and look at the limit of these lines, and they converge to some line over here, right? And this is the this is new. So in my, if I pick this x n and brought them down to the level of x zero then these guys would actually converge to a lamination new, which is the one I found over here. And this is the one which has length 1 in x0. So depending on x0, you get different perspective. So, so this is the picture, right? So the Teichmuller space sits in the space of currents like as a sphere. Uh, ML is like a light cone. Right, and then the mapping glass group acts on all of this stuff. So the way it acts on the Teichmuller space, it just moves it around like that, fixes it, and then the cone also moves things around and fixes it like that. Okay, yeah. Any questions <laughs> so far? So, yeah, so this is, this is the picture of the Thurston compactification. And uh, so if you know that the ML is uh, homeomorphic to R to some power, you know that projectivization is some sphere, so you see how the sphere appears at the boundary of the Teichmann space somewhat naturally.
Some other current, you mean? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, any negative curvature, the quadratic differential is a current. Um, yeah, many things can be thought of as current. Like any metric of negative curvature on the surface is current. You can, in fact, kill some half of it and then have some metric on the support of it. Yeah, I mean, there, there are all kinds of things like that which are currents. That's right, that's right, it's, that's right. Um, yeah, in fact, there, there are examples that if you pick the correct generating set, the word length uh, comes from intersection with some current. The, it's, yeah, so the, there are a bunch of interesting examples out there. This is, this is not just that. And in fact, this comes handy because I want to like uh, translate the usual counting problems about this space of currents, then any kind of new form of current will give me a, a new counting problem. So I just want to unify a bunch of different counting problems at the same time. So, th so that's, the, that's the goal. Uh, yeah, so I want to state the theorem kind of quickly now, but the, I still need a few more definitions. So the, um, there is a symplectic form. The, so let me say the sentence and I say what that means. The intersection number defines a symplectic form on ML. Okay, so, so let's see how that comes about. So the, to, to, to see ML, you, you know, uh, it's kind of hard, but the, if you pick a nice coordinate system, then you see it. Like, you can bunch up a group of laminations which almost look the same and have them be carried by a fixed train track. So uh, maybe I'll start from here. So let a tau, uh, your train track. So a train track is something which locally looks like that. It's a graph, but it has a differential structure. Like a bunch of things are coming, and one of them, like a bunch of things are going out. So at the vertex, they're all tangent to each other. Uh, if you look at the lamination the way I drew it, in fact, I drew a train track. Right? It's like a curve comes and then it splits in two. Like when the two leaves are really close to each other, you don't really see them. Right, uh, so maybe something like that, and this comes out here and connects. So some object like that. So if I have a curve that is long, it potentially can be pushed into the neighborhood of this train track. So I would say they are carried by this. And in fact, you can you have a notion of transverse measure is given to you by a bunch of weights A, B, and C, such that they have the stooch condition. If there are A curves coming here and B coming here, then the number that is going on should be the sum of the whatever is coming in. Right? Okay, so, so delta of tau is the space of the set of admissible weights on tau. That's what it means to be admissible, just the sum of incoming is equal to the outgoing. And there is a map uh, from these sets to, um, this can be real numbers. They don't, I mean, if they're integers, you actually get closed curves. If they're rational numbers, you get weighted closed curves. If there are real numbers, you actually get a lamination. So there's a map from here to ML, which is a homeomorphism to its image. Right. But note that this actually lives in some, uh, some RK. So this is, right, these, are, these are a bunch of real numbers uh, with some inequalities and so on. So this actually is a, some subspace uh, of some RK of dimension, you know, uh, whatever, 6G minus 6. So, the, so one way of defining this is that the symplectic structure of Rn will define for you a symplectic structure on here, right? Uh, if, if, if that's too much for you, you can just say there's a notion of volume here in the Euclidean space, which gives you a local volume structure on ML. That's, so that's, that's all I want, uh, really. I mean, the, the simplicity is not so important. I want to have a notion of volume. And the notion of volume really comes from uh, the volume that you would get in R here. So you might think that this depends on the, the choice of the train track, but it doesn't. The train tracks you can turn into each other by splitting and pushing things together, and all those defined maps which are like linear maps with determinant one, so it turns out the volume is well defined, right? Uh, but yes, if, if you want the intersection pairing here is that if I have a lamination like that, then the tangent space is also a bunch of weights here which are admissible. And if I have two different tangent spaces, then I can, well, so 
Let me just write this anyway. So if you have two different guys, let's say, given to you by sigma 1 and sigma 2, eta 1, eta 2, then uh, the correct, the real intersection between these two weight system is sigma 1, eta 2 minus sigma 2, eta 1, and then you have to sum up over all switches. Okay, and you divide by half. Uh, this is the symplectic form. And the volume form is this omega to the power of 3g minus 3. If you want exact definition, but if you don't care about exact definition, just think about the fact that there's a volume form which comes from embedding locally of ML into the Euclidean space. Right? So this has a name. This is called uh, Thurston volume form. So in the literature, the, the, there are many definitions of Thurston volume form, and there's the issue of normalization. Um, I'm not going to go through the list of them, but I found like five or six. And it's not clear if these definitions are the same. They're all in the same class, they're all in the Lebesgue class, but they're not all the same. So when I say Thurston volume form, that's what I mean, right? The one which comes from the symplectic structure. Right? I mean, you could try to do the lattice counting things into a volume form and see how many integer points you have and define volume like that. And, uh, for me, at least, it's not clear these two definitions are the same, even though people treat them like they're the same. <laughs> okay, so anyway, so if I have an open subset of laminations, I have a notion of volume, right? There's a measure called the Thurston, Thurston measure of that. So this uh, gives me a bunch of functions I can define so I'm going to do some notations and then the stated theorem. Uh, so let's say alpha in the space of currents uh, is a filling current. So filling current means uh, for every beta, intersection of alpha and beta is positive. That's what filling means. Okay. Then I define the size of alpha to be the Thurston measure of all laminations where the intersection number with alpha is less than or equal to one. If I can draw a picture here, so if I have a current, the current defines for me uh, some compact set in here, in a, right? So that's the set of all laminations which intersect the particular current less than that. So the volume of this is what I'm calling M of alpha. Right? So for example, if I multiply alpha by some big number, the set shrinks by a factor of two. This number goes down by the two to the power of the dimension or something like that. Okay, so very good. So for any fling number, I can define something like that. Also for any function, if I have a f from c to r plus, that is a continuous and a homogeneous, I can define m of f exactly the same way, uh, which is the set of all lambdas, where f of lambda is less than or equal to, to 1. Um, and I need one more number which is a number which depends on g, and that's the integral over the moduli space of mx dx. This mx, so x is a current, so it defines m the usual way, and you can average this, well, int integrate this over the whole moduli space, so this is kind of total mass of this mx's. Anyway, so the actual value of this for people who are, haven't seen this before is not so important, is that like, the point is that these numbers are some explicit numbers which depend on alpha, on x, or in this case on nothing, just the, just the genus. Okay. Oh, the way it is on here. Or maybe I should write WPX. Yeah, that's the way it is on volume. Yeah, volume form. Okay. So, great. So, theorem, this is a joint with the Juan Soto. Uh, is that so alpha is filling and f 
is a positive, continuous, and homogeneous. And I'm interested to count the following thing. Let's count the number of elements of the mapping class group, uh, such that if I apply f to phi of alpha, this is less than or equal to L. Um, so the theorem is that this grows polynomially. In fact, we know the degree of the polynomial. It's 6g minus 6. And if I take the limit of this, as L goes to infinity, the limit converges. And I know what the limit is. It's m of alpha, m of f, divided by mg. <laughs> so it's kind of a general counting statement for, for any feeling uh, current and any function. I mean, in fact, the feeling part doesn't matter so much, so maybe I'll get to that if I have uh, some time. But maybe this statement is kind of abstract, so let me give you some instances, like special cases of that, which are statements you have seen before, <laughs> maybe in the literature. So uh, the so there is a special cases is uh, so there's a so look at the case where alpha is a Riemann surface. Uh, actually, no, let me just say alpha is closed curve. So when I say equal, means a closed curve gamma plays the role of alpha. And f is basically hyperbolic length of some curve in x. Then what does this turn into? So my f is a hyperbolic length, and alpha is a curve. So this phi of alpha is all the curves in the fixed homeomorphism class, and this counts the number of curves that have length less than L. Right? So this is a... Uh, so due to Mizahani, is that the, if I take the limit as L goes to infinity of number of phi's such that the hyperbolic length of phi of gamma at x is less than or equal to L. So here gamma is a filling closed curve, and x is any point in the Takamura space. So then this number grows polynomially, like 6g minus 6, and the limit exists, and the limit is m of gamma, m of x. Um, so note that the hyperbolic length is the same as intersection number. And when I pick intersection number, when this f is actually an intersection number, this definition is the same as this definition. The two become exactly identical. So I don't have to write f, I can write m of x divided by mg. So the same kind of constant appears. So the x and gamma are interchangeable. Right there. So the number of curves of type gamma that have length less than L in X grows like that, and the constant is exactly this number. So in fact, Mariam didn't have this. Uh, she didn't know what this number was. So this is a... This is new. And we can actually tell what the constant was. She knew that there's some constant depending on gamma, but she didn't know that this is exactly the, the constant. Um, so this is a special case of our theorem, but not really, because our theorem uses the, <laughs> this theorem. The, so there are, there are aspects of this theorem we have to use. Some aspects of it we improve because we can find the constants, but the rest of it we, we use. So this is kind of a, a special tool in here. So I, would, I should say here, this theorem is not in vacuum, so so following the work of 
Amir Zahani, and also work of uh, Erlinson and Soto. So who did this for intersection number with any current, but yeah, no, not, yeah, they, they had, yeah, remember? They had a, sp a slightly special case of this. I think they had an F here, but this could be only a curve, not any current. So this is a slightly stronger version. And also the, the constant part is, is new. But anyway, so there are similar statements like that in literature before, and in fact, our work very much is inspired by that and it relies on it, but that's, I think that's the, correct way of stating the, the final statement, that for any function and any curve, you can do this counting. So, okay. So you might say, what about the, this curve being filling? And as I said, this is not so essential. If the curve is not filling, um, then you have to divide the mapping class group stabilizer. Um, there is one other issue here you should think about is, what if the curve has some symmetry? Then the number of curves is not the same as number of mapping class groups um, so, if, but I'm counting fees. So if you're counting the curves homeomorphic to a particular curve of length less than something, you'll get a number less than that. You have to quotient by the symmetry of, of the gamma. But, but anyway, so that's, that's one statement that everybody should, should be. I mean, so our theorem is just generalization of this theorem, but it has other surprising instances. So let me give you one more of these, which is kind of a different flavor. So lattice counting uh, in Tychmer space. So what, what is the story here? The, if you have a point, <coughs> well, maybe I don't have to draw it like that. If I fix a point X and another point Y in here, I can uh, apply the mapping class group to Y. So I can look at the mapping class group orbit a y, so here is like phi of y. And then I can pick, maybe I pick a different color. I can pick a ball of radius r around x, and then try to ask or count how many uh, orbit points of y exist in a ball of radius r in type mode space. Right? So this is this is the question. So this is uh, similar to, I guess you can start with the Gauss's problem, and also the theorems in maybe hyperbolic space or symmetric spaces, but by Margulis and so on. So there is a long history of counting problems like that. Maybe I, I won't go over them, but in Tychmuller space setting, so this means uh, given points x and y in Tychmuller space. Uh, what is the number of fees such that the distance between x to phi of y is less than or equal to r? So I'm being vague here for this distance because, in fact, that's what I want to play with. So you, there are a bunch of natural metrics in Teichmuller space. So what people everybody is used to is the, the Teichmuller metric. So let me just pick it. Give two definitions of different metrics. Uh, there's a Teichmuller metric between x and y, which is defined to be the supremum over all uh, simple closed curves gamma of log of square root of extremal length of gamma uh, at x divided by square root of extremal length of gamma oh, at y here, and then at x. This is the Teichmuller metric. And remember, the extremal length is itself uh, in femum <laughs> over all metric in the conformal class of length squared over the volume, and so on. It's kind of a hard metric to, to play with. But anyway, so, uh, and then there, so, but it uses the, the length coming from the conformal structure. In fact, extremal length is length squared over something, so it's really a length squared, so taking a square root here makes sense. 
A square root is what grows linearly with weights, for example. So that's a good definition. And um, analogous to this, Thurston has defined a similar metric using the hyperbolic length. So you can do a supremum where gamma is a simple closed curve of log of hyperbolic length of gamma at y divided by the hyperbolic length of gamma at x. Right, so both of them, given points x and y, is you pick a curve gamma and you look at its uh, uh, its shape over here, and if the curve is somehow much longer here than it was here, then you know that the sur surfaces are very different from each other. And if all the curves have the same length, the surfaces are the same. And then you can choose the extremal length or hyperbolic length to define that. So this distance could be either the Teichmuller distance or the or the Thurston distance, let's say. So in the case of the Teichmuller distance, this was done before. So let me just write when d is equal to Teichmuller distance, there's a theorem due to Atreya, Buffetov, uh, Eskin, and Yuzahani, which states that this number, well, maybe I should call this, I'll write it again, it's okay. The limit as r goes to infinity uh, of number of fees such that the type of x and phi of y is less than r grows exponentially with the exponent 6 g minus 6 and the limit is some number depending on x some number depending on y uh, divided by um, well, the volume, yeah, I don't know what to, they call it mg also, but I have a mg. Uh, so let me call it m uh, which is the volume of the, the Teichmuller space uh, with, a, with a different measure, which I haven't talked about, so let me not do it. Uh, so anyway, so they, they get a function which is kind of similar to the function that we have over here, but the, and then there is this uh, function here on Teichmuller space, which was supposed to be the, the rate, the, you know, telling you how things depend on x and y. And in fact, this function is calculated. So now lambda is in fact. So they call this because they want to like honor the work of Howie. And so uh, yeah, they call this a major reach uh, function. <laughs> but it turns out that lambda is a constant. Uh, so that's due to, I guess, due to Mariam and David Dumas. So we want to like prove an analogous theorem uh, for the Thurston metric, and I'm claiming that that's a special case of that. Yeah, did I rush over this? Was that okay? Um, so note that I have polynomial here versus exponential, so that could be <laughs> a problem, uh, but it's not a big problem. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so in this case, it doesn't matter. The balls of, uh, if you look at the ball of this on x, the number of y's is exactly the same. Asymptotically, it is exactly the same. Yeah, the, the point could be in a thin part or a thick part, doesn't matter, this or it can switch, doesn't matter, and yeah, nothing matters. It's, it's, it's kind of surprising. The, the fact that that lambda is constant is not obvious from definition <laughs> at all. <laughs> right. It's again the Thurston measure of some set of lambdas which have extremal length less than one. It's kind of defined the same way. Um, so, but yeah. Uh, okay. Very good. So let me see how is that an instance of the theorem I just wrote down here. So I define this function d of x, which basically is going to be e to the distance. So the, the distance minus the, the log part, right? So this is equal to the, so dx is a function 
from the currents to R plus uh, defined like that. The supremum over all lambda in ML of intersection of lambda with alpha divided by intersection of lambda with x. So maybe it looks a bit different from that, but it shouldn't be. So basically, the Thurston distance between x and y is log of dxy. <laughs> okay. Uh, see, intersection number, when this is a hyperbolic surface, is just length. But this is defined on all currents, not just surfaces. So I just put intersection number. When alpha is y, that's just length in y divided by length in x, which is what I had before. And instead of uh, curves, I put lamination. That doesn't matter. <laughs> the curves are dense in the space of lamination, so might as well do it like that. OK, so this is going to be playing the role of my f, and y is going to play the role of alpha. I should say, okay. And since I have a log over here, uh, I would say R is equal to e to the L. Is that correct? If this number here is less than L, then the distance is less than log of that, which is uh, R. So I want log of L to be R. <laughs> Uh, so I want L to be equal to e to the r. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's a small difference yes, between them. So, so let's plug everything in and see what happens. So it says the limit as r goes to infinity of number of mapping classes uh, such that the Thurston distance between x and phi of y. So, right. I should say dx of phi of y is less than or equal to L, which is e to the r, divided by L to the power of 6 g minus 6, which is r to the power of, uh, I'm sorry, which is e to the power of 6 g minus 6 r. This exists, and in fact, the limit is equal to m of y times m of dx divided by mg. So we know exactly what the, what the constant is. And then we note that the dx of phi being less than e to the r is the same as log of dx being less than r, but log of dx is the distance. So that's the same as saying the Thurston distance of x and phi of y is less than or equal to r. So, so that's it. You just plug in the correct functions into the counting problem, and boom, you have a lattice counting problem instead of a curve counting problem, right? On the type of space. How much time do I have? I have 15 more minutes. Uh, yes. Maybe I'll just comment about a couple of things. So, unlike, I mean, so you, you can see that here the functions are different. Somehow this is a norm ball, this is a dual norm ball, right? So first of all, the functions associated with x and y are completely different type of function. It's not lambda and the same lambda. There are two different ones. And the reason is because the Thurston metric is not symmetric. Distance from x to y is not the same as from y to x. Uh, so that's one issue. The second thing is this m is not a constant function at all. Uh, as y goes to zero, the, the volume blows up. This is because the the color lemma just says if you squeeze a curve to have length epsilon, the color has length log of epsilon, right? So uh, extremal length is not like that. If you have an extremal length epsilon, the things that cross it have extremal length exactly one over epsilon. So things cancel out. Here they don't cancel out. Uh, so this is not a constant function at all. So the situation is very different, and the proof is somewhat easier. I mean, that theorem was hard. It's a lot of hard work. Um, like hyperbolic dynamics of adjustment flow. And in some sense, we don't have that. So uh, I want to spend some time on the proof of this, but not all aspects of the proof. I want to tell you, like, so the hard part is, in some sense, 
why does the limit exist? And after it exists, you can just play around with it. And then why are these the constants that are related to the, to the limit? And in fact, there's a special step in the work of Mirza Hani, which we improved, so I wanted to like, talk about that. So instead of, uh, yeah, right, talking about the proof of this, maybe I'll talk about the uh, Mirza Hani's proof of this theorem, and I tell you which part of it we can, we can improve upon. So that's in the last uh, 15 minutes. Oh, I do to this. Yeah, there was one more sentence I want to say about this, which is that there are other examples of currents which could be interesting here. Namely, like one thing that comes to mind is that there are lengths associated to other representations of the surface groups. There are now this higher technology theory people uh, so they do representations of surface group into the higher type, you know, higher rank groups, and there are notions of lengths there, which actually do come from intersection number with currents. So if you want to count the number of curves of certain type which have lengths associated with some representation less than something, again, you can apply this. So the theorem is general, works for, for everything. Uh, and maybe the last comment is, there's in fact maybe a hope of even proving the original lattice counting of Atreya, Bufetov, Elskin, and Mirzahani, all you need to know is that somehow the extremal length is some function on currents. So extremal length is a continuous function on ML. This was proven by Kirchhoff, um, but it's not clear that it can be defined as a homogeneous and continuous function. So you need to find a homogeneous continuous function on space of all currents, whose restrictions to ML is the extremal length. And then you put it into this formula and boom, I mean you have this, this one also comes out of it without any work. Uh, so this would be extremely interesting, I think, if the, you know, the loop is kind of complete and you can prove the original problem this way. But I don't know how to do that. Um, okay, so, so that's all the comments um, I have. That's correct, because that, that function, I mean, whatever that function is, will define me some uh, MFs here, which, which would show up as a, yeah, so, we, uh, that's right, this, but it defines a volume for, that's correct, that's right, I mean, it would, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right, uh, okay. Okay, so so let's uh, let's get to the to the proof. So I mean, what is the super clever part of this kind of counting problem? Let me assign some notations here. So you can let's have the S. Uh, so for for the rest of it, just do closed curves and surfaces. So let's say S gamma L uh, sub X to be the number of fees uh, such that. Uh, the hyperbolic length of phi of gamma in X is less than or equal to L. So this is the number we want to kind of count, but writing it this way it allows me to change L and X uh, at the same time. So what Mariam noticed is that if instead of setting this, this number by itself, you should study the, this number as a function on moduli space, and in fact, average it. <laughs> so if you take the integral of S X gamma L dx, again with WT form over the moduli space. Uh, this equal to the volume of some particular set. I call this, uh, what should I call this? It's a B ball of radius L around B L gamma, right? Where B L gamma is a subset of the Teichmuller space uh, defined to be the set of all x's where the length of hyperbolic length of gamma in x is less than or equal to L. See, this has no mapping class group in it anymore. Um, right? So you, you fix your curve. Instead of looking at the orbits of this curve and counting them, you just fix the curve and look at the orbits of the surface for which the length of this curve is less than L. So that's the same number. But then if I let x also vary over the whole moduli space, then I would get an open set. I would get a ball-shaped thing. Um, 
And if the gamma is filling, in fact, this set is compact, so instead of all hyperbolic surfaces, where the length of something is the same. So this is the actual equality, right? So this integral is equal to that. So then the, the proof later follows from the fact of that this is basically a constant. It's not constant. This divided by this number mx that I defined is constant. That's because the whole cycle flow is ergodic and so on, right? And if you fix the number and apply the earthquake flow, then the length doesn't change, and then you get equilibrium and so on. So you can turn this into understanding this number later on. But the key point is, you have to understand what happens to this as L goes to infinity, right? So, <laughs> so the hard part, like one hard part, is what is the, the limit of this volumes exist, and you actually know what it is. So this grows like so. What is the volume of this set? The way is the volume of that as L goes to infinity. So. So compute this WP volume of BL gamma. So, the, so for that, she had to prove that if you look at the Fenchel Nielsen coordinate, this ball, as it grows bigger, it, uh, it's kind of like a polygonal shape thing. Because if you have a fixed curve and it's very long, it basically looks like a simple curve. Um, so if you do like a Fenchel Nielsen coordinate twist around that, curve, then the length doesn't change, so you get like these flat pieces. And then so he divides it to cones and proves that limits of them exist and so on. So this is a lot of the technical, technical work, but in fact this is quite simple. So I won't tell you. The, and not only we can prove the limit exists, I can tell you exactly what it is. Right? So I'll keep the theorem on the board. And the solution is to apply the shearing coordinates and look at this, not in the Taikmula space, but as a subset of uh, ML itself. Remember, what is the shearing coordinate? Uh, Mahan kind of, no, not Mahan, I think Mike alluded to this, right? Did you define this right? So. Uh, basically, if you have a triangulation or some lamination, you can look at the complementary triangles and see the relative position of these guys. Uh, to write that more precisely, so given a lamination uh, geodesic lamination mu, For simplicity, I want to assume mu is maximal, and by maximal I mean the complementary regions are all ideal triangles. Uh, so if I have an x and I have a mu, I can produce a measured foliation out of this. See, mu doesn't have to be measured, it just has to be a lamination. I could basically draw horocycles here until they touch, and then uh, kind of like almost horocycles in each triangle. So uh, basically I produce things which are almost whole cycles and a transverse measure is a length along this one. So the only thing I care about is that if I move this this way or this way, the length is the same. So that's why I picked whole cycles. Right? So there is a map which I call it phi mu from Teichmuller space to what I call MF of mu. So these are the measured foliations uh, transverse to mu. Right? These are exactly these kind of objects. And everybody knows that the measured foliation is basically a measured lamination. I can just pull them tight and think of those measured lamination. And I don't get everything, but this is a subset of ML. In fact, there is an open, dense subset with a full volume. Like the complement has volume zero, right? It's basically only mu is, <laughs> is missing, right? So the first and prove that this map is actually a homeomorphism. Um, so this defines a map here. But in fact, the more is true. Uh, so Bonohan and so then show that this map, in fact, is a simple ectomorphism. So that's uh, due to Monohan and Sozen. 
right? So which means if I want to find, okay, simple ones, if I equip this with the simplex structure coming from the Ray Peterson metric, right? And here I do this structure associated to the intersection pairing, then the map actually preserves the simplex structure. To state this, it would take some, some time, but so basically what it means is if I pick a set in here and I want to find this volume, I just can bring it over here and find the volume in the Thurston measure, right? So, but what is the image of this set? So it turns out the image is actually very nice. So phi mu of this BL gamma is actually a nice convex set. Um, so why is that convex? Because it turns out that the, if I pick straight lines in any shearing coordinates, the lengths of hypotenuse are convex. That's a theorem of a, a, a terrain. So it's a, that doesn't say this exact theorem, but it just says the hypotenuse are convex. And since the BL is defined using the hyperbolic length, the image is actually a nice convex set. So I want to shrink this down. So I want to look at the set 1 over L BL gamma, and I want to say this converges to the set of laminations where intersection of lambda and gamma is less than or equal to 1. So if I look at ML, this guy is some convex set, but becomes more and more straight. This is the set that is defined here. Maybe I should call this, really, this is B1 of gamma. Um, and when I say converges, it just basically means if you pick uh, any sequence of points in here, um, then divide them by L. If they have a limit, it's going to be inside of this, <laughs> this set. Right? And it's an if and only if uh, sentence. But if you have a sequence of convex things which converges point wise, the, their volumes converge. So, so the volume of this converges to that. So the, the Thurston volume of 1 over L, this BL gamma, is so 1 over, so this is equal to, since you have 1 over L here, is L to the power of 6G, so converges to minus 6 times volume of this, uh, which is M of gamma. <laughs> And, and that's where the constant M of gamma comes from. So, so the fact that this guy is converged is actually also follows from the work of, so why do they converge like that? So this follows from the work of a Papadopoulos, because, so I have to say, again, BL is defined by hyperbolic length, and here this set is defined yeah, using the intersection number, and I have to say that these two things are kind of the same, and uh, where should I write this? Maybe I can erase this picture now. So there's a theorem of Papadopoulos. Um, which says that if I have a sequence lambda n's con uh, xn converging to lambda, so let me actually write it like that. So this is uh, points in Tycoma space converging to PML, the way I just said it before. Uh, and then gamma is like a closed curve, then I can compute the hyperbolic length of gamma in Xn and approximate it by um, Ln intersection number of, well, lambda with gamma, and ln section of lambda with gamma plus c. So c depends on the sequence and on gamma, but not on the number n. Yeah, since kind of late, let me tell you what this means kind of more quickly. Basically, if I draw a curve here, gamma, it's clear that this hyperbolic length is bigger than the intersection number with this foliation, because I can push it just down and the length goes down. What Papadopoulos says is that if gamma is very long, 
that's basically equality up to fixed additive error. Right? So that's what that says. So then I can divide by Ln and the C disappears. <laughs> so the hyperbolic length becomes the intersection number. So this guy is nicely converged to this one, and I get, I get what I wanted. Okay, so this gives you both the fact that this converges because they're convex and easily they're converging. So all the technicality of convergence disappears and gives you the answer uh, in a short, easy proof. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs> yes. That's right. It depends on the, if I seek, fix a sequence, then I have a fixed constant which works for any element of the sequence. So it doesn't matter depending on the extent because I'm going to divide by line and it's going to go to zero anyway. Yeah. Yes. You had um, you had counting problems for the Teichmuller metric and for the Thurston metric expressible in this framework. Can you do anything with counting problems relative to Vay Peterson? Uh, no, it's kind of hard to make that well, because first the usual counting would be infinite, right? The, because the space is the, the right. The infinity is finite sense away, so it would be infinite. So you have to somehow mod by that and say don't count the ones which come from twisting around the cusp. And it's not clear how to state uh, a coherence something like that. So, I mean, the easy answer is that no, it's infinite, so it doesn't make sense. Maybe one, but there should be a way to make sense of it, but it's not clear what, what to do. Uh, that's right. So when curve is not filling, then you don't work with ML. You work with ML quotient by the stabilizer. And your group is map and class group quotient by the stabilizer, and you can run the same proof. So, so all the exact this, this, this proof will also work forward. I mean, the map between the correct quotients, the simplified morphism, yeah, everything is the same. I mean, just every step of the proof, you have to just divide by the stabilizer. Um, I should say there's maybe since you didn't ask, but I'll say it anyway. There is one thing left here, though, the, which is that you could be having no stabilizer and not be filling at the same time. Right? And those are exactly laminations. So you have a lamination which has no stabilizer, but it still has something number zero. And that's actually a problem. So if you do the, the same sum, but put a lamination here, then this number again is infinite, and you don't have any stabilizer to quotient. So again, the, there should be a correct version of this theorem which works for that also, but I don't know how to state it yet. It's, it's unclear what to do. But, but I'm sure there is a there is a counting statement involving lamination as well.